uh, we're ready to start. You can find yourself a, a seat. Our next speaker, a columnist with the uh, Richmond Times Dispatch, uh, joining the paper in 1987. You might uh, read his columns on Wednesdays and Sundays or during the legislative session. He does a weekly wrap up on Fridays, he has a podcast. Uh, he's all, all kinds of connected. Uh, if you're interested in Virginia politics, uh, I don't think there's anyone left in the in the press corps who has uh, followed more campaigns and more candidates uh, than Jeff Shapiro. Uh, like me, Jeff is a transplanted northerner and for over 30 years still searching for that good deli sandwich. Uh, Jeff? <laughs> Thank you for having me. I don't know how I rated an invitation back. I visited with you like, the last year. Uh, you were meeting across town at uh, the Omni, and um, I had the uh, high honor or misfortune, depending on one's perspective, to do the warm up for Jim Redbaugh. It's um, not unlike Steve and Edie doing the warm-up for uh, Frank Sinatra. And you know how demanding the chairman of the board could be. And justifiably so. Um, uh, welcome back to Richmond. And um, I hope you have the good fortune of getting out of town before uh, noon tomorrow when the legislature convenes. I don't need to remind you that um, at this point in the calendar, it being an election year, a legislative election year, uh, that the, uh, the boys and girls of, of winter are usually at their worst under these conditions. That's great for uh, yours truly. Um, the more overt they are in their attempts at self-preservation, uh, the, 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 the richer uh, the main the stories coming out of, uh, out of the Capitol. Uh, that in mind, um, it wasn't too long ago that the state legislature of Virginia, not unlike local government, uh, was for the most part uh, happy to solve problems, uh, to find common ground. Um, sadly, that is increasingly not the case, and I would suggest to you that that is in part a consequence of what Virginia has become. And some of these points I may have made in an earlier visit, but I think they are important nonetheless. And that is that uh, you know Virginia is now very much of the nation. The majority of people who live in this state moved here from somewhere else. I don't need to remind you local government people because you probably come in contact with them on a continuing basis as they try to wrap their head around the very unusual structure of government that uh, uh, we have in common. Um, but that uh, influx of, uh, of outsiders, present company included, uh, means that party labels, I think, are much more important. They're certainly uh, very potent, offer very potent cues uh, to voters and to taxpayers. I think that that has tended to nationalize uh, our politics right down to the, to the local level. Uh, redistricting, which is um, a favorite issue of mine, certainly complicates um, this. Uh, the manner in which lines are drawn, more to the point, manipulated, means that narrow bands of the electorate have a disproportionate amount of influence and ultimately um, reduce, if not uh, eliminate, competition. Uh, though I would note that in 2017, uh, we saw a powerful reminder that. Uh, Hyperpartisan gerrymandering uh, is ultimately eroded by the drip, drip, drip of population growth and demographic change. 
Uh, of course, in 2017, when Ralph Northam led that Democratic statewide sweep, uh, much to everyone's surprise, he brought along 15 new Democratic legislators, uh, most of them from urban, suburban areas where the Democratic reflex is strongest. And just as a footnote um, to that, to give you just an idea how lopsided Virginia's growth has, has been, and ultimately contributing to this increasingly national approach to our politics and governance and the resulting gridlock. Um, in Virginia, if a party wins, and the Democrats have done this now several times, 10, only 10 jurisdictions in Virginia with populations of roughly 250,000 to just over 2 million, they win. Um, voting power and the economic power of uh, Virginia is concentrated in places like Fairfax, Arlington, Henrico, Chesterfield, Chesapeake, Virginia Beach, Loudoun, Prince William. Prince William, of course, now a majority, minority, suburban jurisdiction, and uh, the second largest locality uh, in Virginia behind its neighbor, uh, Fairfax. So with all of that in, in mind, I, I don't know that we should be surprised that um, there is uh, less a substance accomplished in the Virginia legislature than perhaps you as local government uh, officials and local government officials largely beholden on, uh, to the legal and constitutional and fiscal beneficence of state government would would like. Um, we have uh, a strengthening economy. Uh, it is most visible in those suburban areas, suburban urban areas. We we'll call them those metropolitan areas, by the way, in which two-thirds of Virginia is planted. I'll give you an idea how quickly this change occurred. In 1945, first gubernatorial election following the Second World War, Virginia had a population of about two and a half million. At that time, two-thirds of the people who lived in Virginia lived in the countryside. So in 70 years, we've seen a complete reversal. Um, with this election foremost in everyone's mind, largely because of the very narrow divisions between the, the parties in the House uh, and the Senate, um, the Republicans, as the majority party, um, want badly to remain in the majority. And Democrats in the minority want badly to restore control, democratic control, of uh, the legislature. How they go about doing it in terms of the issue buttons they, the respective parties, mash is interesting. Uh, the Democrats um, are uh, happy, we're told, uh, by the governor and legislative leaders and a good number of people in the rank of file to, to spend a, a lot of the extra revenue that's been generated by the uh, expanding economy, again, that expands and concentrated in certain areas of the state, and um, uh, the after effects of the Trump tax cut. Maybe there should be sort of the anticipated uh, effects of the Trump tax cut. Uh, that means that Northern administration wants to spend more money on teacher salaries, uh, which would require all of you to come up with matching funds to bump up an already anticipated raise. Uh, spend money for uh, school counselors. This is part of the school safety uh, uh, program that the Democrats uh, uh, are pushing, and by the way, a school safety program that includes a gun control element. Uh, the Republican version of which does not. Uh, perhaps no surprise 
there, uh, given the importance of gun rights advocates within the Republican coalition. Uh, the governor would like to spend more money, and Democrats, for the most part, concur on continuing to clean up the uh, Chesapeake Bay. Uh, surprisingly, this seems to have done little, uh, uh, along with a long, relatively reliable record of, uh, on, on bay cleanup and bay preservation by a bay native, Ralph uh, Northam. None of this seems to have done anything to uh, diminish the um, outright anger of uh, Democratic Greens over his um, tacit support of the two natural gas pipelines that are um, under construction in Virginia. Um, and then today, the governor, because um, you know he believes, as um, Lyndon Johnson once hoped to uh, say to Ho Chi Minh, "Come, let us reason together," uh, that there are potential, there is a potential for bi bipartisanship. Uh, today, the governor and uh, Western Republicans uh, announced uh, uh, an agreement on a toll financed plan to improve um, a road that is soon to overtake the Long Island Expressway as the world's largest parking lot, Interstate 81. Um, my recollection of um, federal transportation regulation is that imposing tolls on federally financed roads, I believe, requires the consent of the federal government. Um, which is barely working these days. Uh, so, and then over to the Republican side. Uh, the Republicans are uh, eager to do what uh, President Trump and the you know, former Republican majority in Congress uh, hoped would uh, perpetuate Republican hegemony in Washington, cut taxes. Um, more more precisely, uh, somehow conform Virginia's tax laws to the new federal tax laws so that Virginians are not penalized, a word Republicans frequently use, by certain changes at the federal level that can, in effect, uh, increase taxes for Virginians. Um, I suspect you all have had a conversation about uh, what the new tax law means for local property taxes and the limits on the deductions uh, that property owners will be able to take. Uh, if you are a Northern Virginian or if you live in some of the other more prosperous areas of the state with uh, higher tax rates, uh, that could be a uh, pain in the pocket book. Uh, but it is the Republican view uh, that um, this will somehow energize the Republican base uh, and uh, may even win over um, some Democratic leaning, if not outright Democratic suburban voters who are not happy about paying higher taxes or the prospect of higher taxes. My memory is a little dim on this, but the last time this issue of, and the one word to describe this process of somehow melding the state and federal tax codes, conformity. The last time this was done was during the Reagan tax cut in the 1980s, and it was a relatively painless process uh, carried out by Ed Willey, who was the chairman of the Finance Committee, uh, Senate Finance Committee here in Richmond, and um, Dick Bagley, who was the chairman of the Appropriations uh, Committee, and I think it was Ted Morrison, was the chairman of the Finance Committee? No. No, uh, Hanway Marks was the chairman. I believe it was. Uh, uh, was it C. Richard Cranwell? You know, he's, he's, by the way, Richard Cranwell, God love him. He is. Um, there are few people who uh, play politics with uh, the enthusiasm uh, that is synonymous with C. Richard Cranwell. Um, he still keeps an eye on the game. I guess it's good eye. But anyway, so uh, on back to the, the tax 
proposal that the Republicans are, are, are pushing. Um, this came up in a conversation um, I, I had with uh, one of your um, one of your able staffers, and I think there, there is some wonder if if tax cuts couldn't save the Republican majority in the U.S. House of Representatives in changing districts, what will tax cuts mean in Virginia, where we also see changing districts on the House side? Uh, there's a wild card in all of this, um, and that is redistricting. Um, as you know, um, as you may know, uh, the federal courts have thrown out the House of Delegates redistricting plan as uh, racial gerrymandering. That it was an intentional effort to um, to dilute a minority voting strength, uh, largely by, the thinking was interesting, by denying African Americans, primarily African American voters, a chance to uh, show some, demonstrate some voting strength in suburban areas. Um, there were 11 House districts that were uh, thrown out. Uh, the legislature has, uh, uh, has not come up with an alternative. The court is in the process of developing uh, one, actually several, sort of like a Chinese menu. You may have seen some of the stories before the holidays uh, when, the, when the court rolled out some possible plans. There was a column A plan and there was a column B plan. And uh, among the possible casualties um, of these plans were Chris Jones, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee from the city of Suffolk, and uh, also, uh, and casualty may be too strong a word in, in, in this case, but his is a district that nonetheless is changing quickly, the Speaker of the House, Kirk Cox from Colonial Heights, uh, the Chesterfield County side of his district is showing a greater um, Republican, excuse me, Democratic tendencies. And, um, I don't know how many of you uh, followed closely uh, some of the local elections in Chesterfield County, concurrent with the congressional uh, election in which Dave Bratt was defeated by Abigail Spanberger, but uh, it was the county of Chesterfield, it was those precincts in Chesterfield that delivered that House seat for the Democrats. And it was that House candidate whose coattails brought in a Democrat uh, as Commonwealth's attorney, a left of center Democrat as Commonwealth's attorney. So Virginia is, and its suburbs are very much a, a work in, um, in progress. And um, I think you will see lots of evidence of that over the next 46 days. Because of this, these changes in, in Virginia, and I suspect there are people in this room from Portsmouth, Danville, and Bristol, if you would raise your hands. Roll those bones. <laughs> I mean, isn't it amazing? Um, Virginia was a state that resisted a lottery, resisted horse race, gambling, paramutual uh, gambling, and uh, now if the public opinion polls are to be believed, and I think of the polling primarily as a curiosity, eight in ten Virginians are perfectly happy with the idea of uh, casino gambling. I think that the, the the attitude of Virginians, of contemporary Virginians, could be described as libertarian, and uh, that their attitude is that Virginians should be, you know, free to gamble, understanding the risks, and that the House, for the most part, usually wins, but that uh, somehow the, uh, the state should at least um, help itself to some of the, uh, the lucre that, that this generates. Um, there will be legislation that would allow Danville, Portsmouth, and Bristol, with the consent of their voters, uh, to open casinos. We're uh, 
we still chuckle back here in, at, the, at the paper over the possibility, and this is certainly unlikely, uh, and has been indicated as, as such, that the Bristol Casino would be housed in the same shopping center that uh, would house a, a medical marijuana operation. <laughs> You know, so getting high while getting low. <laughs> I believe that uh, there are going to have to be some changes uh, because of that. The, the thinking uh, in the, these are economically, fiscally stressed uh, localities, I think is the term of art in municipal uh, government. And the feeling is that uh, somehow uh, casinos would uh, enhance, uh, magnify the appeal of these cities at least as, say, tourist uh, destinations. And uh, it's nothing short of amazing uh, when one considers, for example, uh, Bristol's interest, the number of the uh, coal uh, execs, or the coal barons, as we used to call them some years ago, who were behind this, uh, have enlisted as their patrons uh, uh, for the enabling legislation two socially conservative Republicans from Western Virginia, uh, who were prepared to set aside their own prejudices largely in the, uh, in the interest of economic development or the promise of economic development. Which brings me to another issue that I'm not sure we're necessarily going to see addressed this year, perhaps discussed uh, in, in passing, and it is um, it is what a former governor refers to as the two Virginians issue. Jerry Belisles was the governor, Democratic governor, from 1986 until um, 1990. Uh, recently gave a, uh, a speech to higher education officials who was here in town in which he laid out a plan uh, to help jumpstart, albeit incrementally and over a long period of time, the economy of rural Virginia. The Lyles has very sound bona fides and, and on this issue as a uh, native of Patrick County who broke into politics as a delegate from the city of Richmond. Uh, what he is proposing is taking what's left of the tobacco settlement fund, uh, once north of a billion dollars, now at about 500, uh, wresting it from the control of a bunch of legislators who for the most part have used it as their, and I'm sure this will get back to them, so what the hell, a slush fund. <laughs> and it, you know, I don't know anyone quarrel with that. Yeah. We're investing in bowling alleys, and you name it. Um, most of which generated little sustained economic developments in the areas that these members represent. And what Belisles has proposed doing uh, is establishing that corpus as a trust fund, which would then pay for educational opportunities for rural Virginians, whether it is higher education, whether it is vocational education. The idea is to um, create a solid mass of educated, trained people in areas of the state that are seeing precipitous declines in their pools of educated, trained people. And I would add, and I think, uh, Jim, you handled this um, issue some years ago. Uh, there was an initial snapshot of the tobacco fund. Um, I think that investigation was led by Governor Bilal's and you doing the staffing that showed it was pretty much out of control and largely unaccountable uh, to the people it was intended to serve. Um, I think one episode really captured people's attention and that was when the executive director was caught with his hand in the till. <laughs> you know, the newspaper men are, newspaper people, excuse me, are, you know, are given to oversimplification. It's, it's what the president calls fake news. Um, on the social side of the legislative uh, uh, calendar uh, is an issue that I think many people thought was pretty much dead and gone and that uh, 
maybe the arc of time and political change and cultural shifts had addressed, and that is the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, the debate, I think, is going to be not just over whether it should be passed, but and if Virginia were to pass it, that would be the, we would be the 38th state to approve it, and that would then meld it into our Constitution. Maybe. And the question is, you know, can uh, is Virginia's uh, action in that area uh, even um, worth it? Uh, is it too? Is it not too late uh, to um, to act? So uh, we will see. But it is an issue that for Republicans who are, again, somewhat nervous about what might happen in November, it's, it's an opportunity for some of them to somehow um, transmogrify themselves uh, into um, socially conscious, um, woman-friendly legislators. Uh, Glenn Sturdivant, who is a state senator from the uh, suburbs of Richmond, whose, whose district has gone Democratic uh, three times, I believe, statewide. We just go around during the gubernatorial election. I believe it, it may have been, no, it was not carried by Hillary uh, Clinton. But two out of three is not that. Suddenly, Glenn Sturdivant is a big fan of the Equal Rights Act. He's been traveling the state with a Democratic delegate, a, a first-termer, uh, Jennifer Foy, first woman VMI alumna. So I guess it's a redundancy. First VMI alumna in the General Assembly. Um, arguing for adoption of the, of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, if I have the voting record that he has and is worried about suburban pushback, uh, yeah, I guess I would do that too. Uh, you may remember that uh, Glenn Sturdivant was among those once believed potentially persuadable Republicans who steadfastly resisted Medicaid expansion. That is bringing Virginia fully under the Obamacare uh, umbrella. And to that point, and I think this is a reminder of um, shall we say, the very steep learning curve that uh, governors often face. Uh, with that big get and wad of cash, uh, it looks like a big piece of it could go to balance the books on the Medicaid side because of a, a miscalculation by the Northern Administration on the cost of elder care. That was about a 470, 470 million blunder. Uh, so that's a big piece of, of change to, um, to look after, uh, follow uh, as well. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I should have prefaced my remarks by saying I'm far more interested in what you all have to say uh, than what I could possibly and it's you know folks like you who uh, fully inform me and uh, uh, remind me how you know often for me it's a swing and a miss. So I'm happy to take um, any questions, and I recognize that our presentation has been quite broad, and that there are probably some issues in which you have a particular interest that I may not have addressed. I'm prepared to do so now with the stipulation that. I may not know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. John. Uh, Jeff, with the addition of 17 freshmen to the General Assembly after the last election, uh, what kind of changes have you noticed in terms of uh, the dynamics of the, of the House in particular? Um, the, the Democrats, of course, need only two seats for absolute control in, in the House and um, two in the Senate uh, as well. And I'm going to back into that, John, because there's a special election today up in uh, Northern Virginia for a state Senate seat. The Democrats are, are favored to hold that seat, uh, though the Republican nominee is uh, uh, among the few Republicans in Virginia who believes in life after birth, Joe May. 
Um, but I think the government shutdown is probably really going to stir the, uh, the Democratic vote or the, certainly the anti-Trump vote and likely lift uh, Jennifer Boisco to the Wexton seat. Uh, but these narrow divisions, um, I think, are uh, made more interesting by the divisions within the caucuses. And in the House Democratic caucus, with all of those new faces, 15 new faces, uh, there was um, the anticipation last year that there would be a lot of uh, bomb throwing on the part of those newbies. Uh, I think for the most part they were pretty well behaved and they were actually uh, in a position on a couple of occasions, one in particular comes to mind, to um, exercise a good deal of leverage. You may recall the fight over, I call it re-re-re-regulation of um, the electric utilities. And there was a vote on the floor of the House um, that dealt with um, one of the important accounting features of this Dominion Energy pushed bill that the Democrats voting as a block and attracting nine uh, fairly conservative uh, uh, House Republicans pushed this thing through and forced the governor to go back to the bargaining table um, with, um, with Dominion. Uh, the more, uh, I think, flagrant manifestation of the restlessness of these younger newbies uh, was this very public expression of discontent with David Toscano, the House Democratic leader, in an attempt to remove him. Interestingly enough, the face and voice of that, um, that effort was um, Delegate uh, Boisco, uh, who may be going over to the um, Senate. And by the way, and I'm just thinking out loud here, if she is elected, and will have to, of course, resign her, House seat, that means there will only be 48 Democrats. And um, if you were the Speaker of the House and had the authority to call a special election because the vacancy popped up while the legislature was in session, and you were looking at this very narrow majority, would you be in a hurry to call a special election? So I'm wondering what uh, Cox will do assuming a Boy Scout uh, election. Those tensions are evident to John within the Republican caucus, and I think most notably on the Senate side. Uh, the Republican majority leader, of course, is from your neighborhood, uh, Tommy Norman. He's sort of the Mitch McConnell of the Virginia Senate in that he's just you know, the ultimate gamesman. Um, but he is innately a moderate Republican and once was actually a Democrat. Uh, some of us remember when he showed up at a Senate, a Democratic Senate convention as a delegate for Hunter Andrews. Um, but if, uh, I think he is trying to do everything he possibly can within this very rest of Republican caucus, which is becoming very House-like in terms of its um, forcefulness. Um, he's doing everything he can to accommodate them because he wants to remain majority leader. And I don't know what's going to happen with the, um, the Republican majority in the, the Senate. Uh, Dick Black's resignation may help Republicans, some Republicans argue. Um, but there's also a view that, given what's been going on in Northern Virginia, and the fact that a Democratic delegate from Loudoun County is running for that seat, that, that could be a very difficult seat for the Republicans to hold. That could swing the Senate. And then Norman, conceivably, would be out of a job. Um, I'm, I don't know that uh, he would be uh, embraced by the Republican caucus as constituted were a minority caucus.
So, I'm running out of time. Yes, that's why I have to follow it a little bit. Okay. So, no other questions? Not even one? <laughs> one. One question. So, the governor has uh, probably two interesting bills. One is the driver's license and the other one is coal ash. Uh, by the way, on coal ash, um, this is another issue that suburban Republicans are trying to use to somehow you know, create a friendlier issue, issue, image for themselves. Amanda Chase from Chesterfield, in whose district there is a coal burning plant, and which is adjacent to the towns of this toxic detritus. Uh, she's been trying to get the Republicans to do something about this since she came to the Senate a couple years ago. Um, on the driver's license. Uh, there's been a lot of momentum in that area, and it's coming not just from within the caucuses, but the courts. As you know, there have been decisions uh, by the federal courts, uh, shall we say, challenging the constitutionality of such things. So um, there could be uh, some uh, pedal to the metal on that one. Uh, watch Dominion. Dominion doesn't want to pay for anything it doesn't have to if you're writing a sentence with a preposition. And the company has then indicated that it would like to see the ratepayers absorb that cost. But you know, the ratepayers absorb a lot of costs. I wonder, and I'm just tossing this out, if this is sort of an easy one for the legislature to demand that the, the cost uh, of these of this cleanup be absorbed entirely by the company, as opposed to the Ratepayers, since the legislature is already seen as having rolled over uh, for Dominion a number of times, essentially becoming a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, a publicly traded energy company. Thank you.